Hello and welcome to the BA Brew. I'm Mike. I'm Petra. And I'm Kate. And today we're talking about mental health and I'm really pleased to welcome Petra here. Um, and Petra, would you like to give us an introduction and, and explain a bit about what you mean by mental health? Of course, thank you for having me. So, so I'm Petra Velzebor, uh, CEO of, of PVL, psychotherapist, mental health expert. And what we mean when we talk about mental health is really about the health of our mind. So it applies to everybody. Usually when we say mental health, people immediately think of mental illness. So they think depression, anxiety, a diagnosis of some kind. But really, if life has taught us anything throughout COVID and the world that we're in, it's that we all have mental health just like we have physical health. And it can move up and down depending on what challenges are going on in our life at any time. Okay. And, and as I say, I'm delighted that Petra's here to join us. I, I first heard Petra at the BA conference, and um, it's it's an amazing story. Petra has, has got lots of um, amazing um, experience, and it was really quite, um, well, fascinating, moving, and just, just well, such a, such a fabulous story. Um, so thank you for joining us, Petra. It's really nice thank to have you. you here. Kate, um, welcome. Welcome to today's BA Brew. What, um, yes. You were keen to join this session, weren't you? Very keen to join us. Very keen to join, yeah. So um, I've done quite a bit of coaching um, sort of, uh, and my role within um, ASSIST is as a mentor. Um, so it's really important It's really important to us that the people that we work with um, are healthy and that we're checking in and making sure that, you know, that that holistically everything is okay, not just how they're progressing through their apprenticeship. So yeah, it's a really, I think it's a really key focus within ASSIST at the moment. Um, and I'm, I'm really interested as well, just, you know, we all work in um, sort of disparate teams now. We work across the country, which is fantastic and so many advantages to it in terms of the different areas of your life so you know as a working mum with two young children balancing career children football training and all of those things so it's it's sort of very much i think at the forefront of everyone's minds i think at the moment um so yeah so really excited to uh, to be discussing it and then learning as well like offering something for our ba community so being able to offer something out on how we can um be more self-aware of our own mental health and support ourselves and our colleagues um, in their mental health and how we can apply that in some circumstances as well within the project world. So actually applying that um, to the work that we do as well. So. Yeah, so Petra, um, can you tell us a little bit about your story and, and sort of uh, follow on from that? Because it's um, really quite uh, remarkable where you are today from where you've been. Thank you. I, I appreciate that. Um, well, it, I guess for many of us in the mental health space, the topic is deeply personal, right? We've been through something ourselves or somebody close to us has been to something pretty dark and it sort of influenced how we view life and the focus and passions that we have in our, in our work and the things that we do. Um, so I grew up in a very alternative way, grew up in a religious cult, um, you know, very well known uh, across the internet and places that sensationalize things. But to, to bottom line it, we, we didn't go to school as kids. Um, the world was supposed to end. We were essentially trained from birth to be God's end time army is what they referred to us as. Um, so no pressure, right? As far as um, the intensity of, you know, you, this is your purpose in life. Like nobody asked me when I was growing up, who do you want to be when you grow up? Or who do you, who, what do you want to do? What kind of job do you want to do? Um, and because there was a sense that that wasn't going to happen anyway. So for me, it led me to this really dark place of questioning things, wondering what the truth was. I mean, imagine growing up having the truth so fixed as one thing your entire childhood. And I've realized as, as, as different as this story is for, men, for to, to many people's experience, I've since realized in telling my story that many people have these fixed ideas through their culture, their parenting, religion, um, you know, uh, ideas of where they should be headed in life. And for many people that leads them to wearing a mask. So especially in the workplace, showing up as we should show up but even in relationships, even in friendships, even in those places that should be the closest people to you, we show up with humor and jokes and like everything's fine and underneath might be struggling in, in really big ways. So, so for me, it led to alcohol addiction, depression, 
suicidal ideation. I had two young kids. So, so um, just trying to figure out how to build up my own mental health without knowing all of the ins and outs of it. And so over time, I studied to be a psychotherapist. I worked in youth mental health and my career developed, but I had to get sober. I had to practice and experiment with some of these things on my own life. Um, because it's it's through that experimentation that I realized, oh, there are some principles that support people, but it's not a one size fits all. And each of us needs to go on our own journey of learning how to invest in our mental health. So that's like a different way of thinking about it. So rather than like, you know, some people have mental health or mental illness, some people don't. It's like, each of us go through different phases of our life as we grow older, and we need to think about how do we invest in our mental health, just like we invest in our career, our education, and different aspects of our life. So I hope that gives you just a little sense of, of the journey so far. Yeah, it's, I mean, it certainly does. It's, um, as I say, quite quite inspiring. Um, at, the, at the conference, you mentioned um, a number of questions and the importance of some questions to ask. And and I think as a little teaser, well, I'll, I'll sort of set that out here, but we won't say what those questions are. We'll save that as a, as a later thing, because I think they're really, really quite powerful questions. Kate, Kate what, uh, what were your, your thoughts? No, I, it's so interesting. Your story is fascinating. I, I've watched your uh, your TEDx talk as well. Um, and you. I think it's what I love about it is it's about your own journey. So there is no one size fits all. That's the key takeaway for me. So, you know, everybody has their own boundaries around what they're doing and they have to find what works for them. Um, and I also love that aspect of practicing um, because I think it's something where people think, right, I'm going to follow this and that's going to be fine and I'm going to be fixed. I'm going to feel better or this is going to sort itself out. And actually, you've got to be OK with having that sort of growth mindset, haven't you? Of I'm going to practice here and it might not work, but I'm going to see what I learn from it and I'm going to keep practicing. And even if it doesn't work today, then maybe it works in another way. So I, I, sort of, I love that element of it as well. We're, we're seeing a real rise in anxiety, just to, as an example, depression, anxiety. And part of it, to, to, to back up uh, what, what you were saying, is people are out of practice in connection, integrating in their workplace, feeling a yeah. sense of team, being in person. We need connection and a sense of belonging for good mental health. Yeah. That can look different for different people. So when your anxiety is up, many people go, well, let me just listen to my body but they're using it in the way that it's not intended. So I'm listening to my body. That means I feel anxious. So I'm not going to go out or do anything or push myself out of my comfort zone. When actually, while I'm all for listening to your body, we also need to challenge ourselves. When's the last time I practiced or experimented with picking up the phone, calling somebody, doing something that was outside of my comfort zone? Like those things, and the more you do them, the more your anxiety dissipates because you're like, oh, now it's like, you know, it's, it's healthy to have a little um, stress or anxiety when you push yourself out. But then you do it again and again, and that experience uh, reduces your anxiety. So do you see the balance between kind of listening to that, but then actually, oh, actually, maybe I'm just out of practice. Yeah, absolutely. And it, it feels like there has to be something that really resonates with you to be able to do it, because there's lots of talk of going out of your comfort zone. But actually, then there, there needs to be, I guess, quite a lot of um, inward thinking about, well, what does that mean to me? What's my what would that look like for me? And what does going out of my comfort zone really mean? And what stage of your life are you in? So it used to be that getting out of my comfort zone was simply waking up at a certain time and getting out of bed. You know what I mean? Yeah, it used yeah. to be putting down a drink. That was getting out of my comfort zone. It used to be walking around my block, right? Or sitting in an AA meeting and saying one sentence that was true about how I was feeling. That used to be what getting out of my comfort zone was. Now it's writing a book. It's, it's standing on bigger stages. It's bigger things. But there's no way I could have done those things back in the day at the beginning. So that's where that self-awareness of like, where am I at right now? And for me, what is one small thing that will get me out of my comfort zone? And then I call it habit stacking. Yes. So over time, you build those habits and then you look back and go, how the hell was that getting out of my comfort zone when actually now I'm able to do these things? And your trajectory is going to be different. But we know that there are some fundamentals around connection, self-awareness, 
learning, putting yourself out there, exercise movement that can enable good mental health. Yeah. We were talking uh, talking previously about goals and the importance of goals and that, and having that idea of where you want to get to, seeing where, where you want to be, and then taking small steps, so mini goals that maybe just take you slightly slightly beyond your comfort zone, so moderate discomfort. But as you say, that's cumulative, isn't it? That you, you get used to that discomfort and think, well, actually, I could do something a bit more dramatic next time. Um, but how important is that, is that, um, that goal, having some kind of goal there? I love goal setting, but I also think there's a bit of a cult of goal setting with influencers and things like that, which are like, you know, have unreasonable goals and all of this, right? <laughs> and I love a motivational speaker, don't get me wrong. I'll, I've listened to one this morning just to get me going for the day, right? Um, but it's like, what we, what we think is a tiny goal for the person who's struggling with their mental health, they feel like it's a huge goal, right? And so for me, like get walking on a Friday night to go to an AA meeting, that was huge. I would have a battle in my brain about doing it, about making sure I went, about the fears about what might happen. And, you know, we might think, well, that's just a tiny goal. Just go there and show up. That's all you have to do, right? So it's not so much how big or how small you feel it is in the moment, right? But it is about continued forward action. And so back in the day, I never used to have a three-year, a five-year plan. Remember, I grew up thinking the world was going to end every two or three years. So having something like a three to five year plan was just well beyond anything I could conceive of. But having a goal for that week, for that day, for that minute was sometimes all I could do. But then again, that's habit stacking. Now, I generally work within a year and three years is how my brain thinks. But I'll think of a vision. So I like a vision of my life because then, then I can feel open to what the how is, right? So having some health habits, having a massive vision, and then just consistently doing those, then you're open to opportunities and your life can just radically change. I can I can see we can we could get into a BA technique here. We could we could talk about Vmost, but I'm not going to go down that route. So if, if you want to know about Vmost, you can look up at Vmost on the Learning Zone. There's a great little video on there. But uh, Kate, stop me from talking about Vmost. <laughs> well, I was going to I was going to ask. I'm really intrigued in how important reflection is, and I, I don't know if this leads into uh, part of the three questions that you have that you um, ask as well. But because sometimes I think that reflection, you can get lost sometimes, depending on who you are, you can get a little bit lost in, oh, this went well, this didn't go well. or um, And, you know, in coaching, we, we always talk about moving forward, but sometimes that sort of reflection on how well we've done or something that's not quite hitting the mark, I guess, could be quite important in helping us then continuously move forward. There's a difference between reflection and rumination, yeah. right? Rumination is like overthinking, obsessing, I'm um, getting stuck in a shame hole. How did I do this wrong? Like, oh my God, I can't believe it. Spiral, spiral, spiral. Reflection is like, what happened? Be awake to it. What could I have done better? Um, what would I do differently next time? And I actually think it is crucial because I'm a coach as well. And I, I, you know, I love that difference between, okay, let's look in the past versus let's look in the, to, the, to the future. And of course, the future is, and the present is where the only place where anything is possible, right? But I think it's important for us, any person to tell their story with a witness at least one time. And that might be it. And so that could be a therapist, it could be a friend, it could be a parent, a sibling, whatever. Um, but knowing what your story is and who you are is crucial to stepping into your power. And that sounds a little bit like cheesy and, you know, Tony Robbins-y. Um, but, but your power is like, um, what's possible for you in the future. So it's, I think it's important to know where we've come from. So I'm all about reflection uh, and checking in on how I feel about something and then letting it go. Let it go. What's possible now? Continued forward action. Does that make sense? That, that works in my brain. Everybody's brain is different, but I, I think it's important to note the difference between rumination and reflection. Yeah, no, that's, that's really helpful. Thank you. I wondered- I was gonna... Oh, go oh sorry. sorry, Kate. No, I was going to say, I wondered if that would segue into, into some of the questions and some of the... I, exactly that. I was just thinking, this is the perfect point to, to, to raise those questions, really, Petra. So um, you guys are talking about the questions as if there's some, like, <laughs> like there aren't some pedestal of questions. Some questions. I'm thinking, I'm thinking <laughs> oh, which questions? Um, but I, I think you mean, the, like, how do we check in on each other effectively? Is that correct? 
uh, well, right well it was about the um your own journey so finding uh, finding the way through for yourself so um and and stepping into um stepping through those questions to say what what you you wanted to achieve where you wanted to go so, so questions that i would ask myself in order yeah, to move myself yeah. forward i feel like mm. you guys have some that have impacted your lives from my talk but i'm trying to remember which ones they were um i mean for me it's about bravery so it's about thinking what is one brave step that i can take and so that could be the smallest tiniest thing as we've discussed but for me um there, you know, people talk a lot about vulnerability, about authenticity, and that those are great words that might work for you. But for me, it's like, how do I practice bravery is one of the questions that I would ask myself. Um, but I think it's important. There's the things we challenge ourselves with, but there's also the ways that we check in on other people, which I, which I wonder if that would be useful for, for your audience yeah, as well. I think so, so. so many, so many times we think, you know, well, I asked them how they were or how their weekend was. I checked in, right? Um, and, you know, they said they were fine. So, yay, we're all checking in on each other, right? Um, when, when actually, I think if we're getting the same responses all the time, I'm fine. Oh, you know, we're all struggling a bit these days. I'm fine sort of responses. Why don't we challenge ourselves to ask each other different questions, which is what we do in our team, which is what we do um, with, with our friends and our family and that sort of thing. So, Asking people, what's the biggest challenge you're facing at the moment, you know, is a real specific question that en enables people to realize that you're ready to listen to them, right? What's the biggest challenge you're facing? Um, if there was one thing that you needed for today, what might it be? Um, how can you, how do you invest in your mental health? What's one way that you might invest in yourself this week? How can the team back you up? So it's what we're doing is we're creating positive accountability as a team to check in with each other and normalize conversations about mental health, not just when we're struggling, because so many teams never check in, are all about tasks, and then when somebody's struggling, they think, well, they, I'm, I, they should, could have come to me. Why didn't they come to me? And you're thinking, well, you haven't built the building blocks of psychological safety and trust, which is what those little things are that can happen in the structures of your day, but also informally. And this means it's everybody's responsibility, not just the HR person, the well-being lead, even the manager. It's everybody. You can manage upwards and ask these sorts of questions. But what have I missed? I sort of went off on a tangent there. So, yeah, so you, you said about practice and bravery. Um, bravery. So well, how can I be brave? So how, how are you brave? How can you be brave? What are the, what, how do you look forward and say, right, I'm going to do this and that's going to help me get to this point? So it, again, it can be the smallest thing. So my act of bravery today could be having a civil conversation with my ex-husband. Hmm. That, that's real. I, I didn't ask if I could swear. Um, um, my act of bravery could be checking in on a team member who totally seems cool and chilled. But I'm, you know, I'm just going to check in and ask some questions anyway. My act of bravery totally was writing my book. Right. Because it's like, oh, putting a part of your soul on paper and people can kind of ask you things about it. Um, well, I would, let me let me uh, flip the question and just think, what might your act of bravery be if you were to think that one small thing, tiniest thing of all? Kate, what about oh, you? Yeah. Well, as host, I'm clearly yeah. going to say Kate. Kate's <laughs> yeah. going to go first. It gives me a little bit more time to think. <laughs> at the question just well, I mean for me this is quite an act of bravery being on a on a course and just yeah and uh, yes. but I was thinking about it in terms of the BA role and like sort of that thing around um being brave enough to actually ask stakeholders because so often you're working with senior stakeholders and we label them as sort of advocates or detractors or challenging stakeholders and actually and, and so the questions that we then or the way that we might try then to bring them along uh, the, the change journey with us is to you know how's this working for your team or um what is it that you want and i'll try and get it for you and we sort of like try and appease that person but actually sitting down and being brave enough to say hey what's your biggest challenge with this project or what is it that that for you isn't working today what was it, what is it that you'd like to, like some just slightly more bold questions i think and really thinking about it um and it's that personal element it's got nothing to do with do you think the change is a good idea it's actually about let me connect with you and let's see how that takes us forward 
and it's being forward. forward. So you're saying, so what I'm hearing is it's being brave to ask for feedback as well. Like, how could I do this differently? How could I serve you better? Yeah. Um, and, and I just voice noted one of my team this morning. I said, hey, I had this thought that maybe this thing that I do isn't as useful as I think it is. I'd love some feedback on it. So it takes bravery to do that. Yeah. Um, and it takes bravery to be okay as well. And so somebody, it was your conference that someone came, remember I said, it, it takes bravery to say, hey, I'm doing real good. Like I exercised this morning or I meditated or I, I practiced gratitude. Like, how are you doing? In this world of like media fear and like everyone's struggling, you know, we sometimes feel like we have to also go like, yeah, I'm struggling. And somebody came up to me after your conference and they went, Petra, Petra. And they took, pulled me to one side and they said, thanks so much for saying that it's okay to be okay. Because she went, um, I'm on the best salary I've ever been. She's whispering. Um, she went, uh, I had a promotion, like life's really good. Like my kids are good. And, but she's whispering. And so um, that would just said to me, so many of us are losing the chance of being brave enough to be a light in the world and to be like, life is good or it's, it's a struggle, but I'm doing these things to invest in myself. And Mike, we're obviously not going to let, let you off the hook. Um, <laughs> Kate's just sparking my thinking. What's one of your brave act? Um, well, I, I had a bit of a scare recently with my blood pressure being ridiculously high. And I don't know why my blood pressure has gone so high. Um, and one, I, my brave, my brave thing is about continuing to do my running. I, I, I'm a big fan of running. I do park run every week. I do races and things. And after I took my blood pressure, and it was it was a ridiculous number. It's 180 over 110, which is way higher than the, the 150 over 80, which I think is where they say mm. hypertension kicks in. Um, and so the next day when I went for a run, I just held back and thought, I'm really nervous about this. But the day before, I ran fine, and it was like not an issue. But just that clicking over and thinking about that got me really worried um so I've held back in my running um but I saw the doctor yesterday and I, I just need to be a brave again and say let's just continue running because the running's good for my blood pressure and I will get the treatment so I kind of admitting that maybe I do need to take some medication because I'm not getting any younger maybe I need to moderate that and accept that but just continue to be brave and keep going out it doesn't sound that brave to me but it kind of I did feel Very really anxious brave. Yeah. Really anxious about it. And, but what I'm also hearing for men who are in the audience is it can be brave to visit your doctor and, and show yeah. up and check your yeah. health and check so I things. Took, yeah, go ahead. Yeah, I took that first step. That was that was a scary thing because I'm thinking my blood pressure is really high and I put off seeing the doctor because I thought maybe it'll come down again um, and it hasn't. So taking that step and seeing the doctor and thinking, okay, yeah, well, there is something here. Nothing to worry about immediately, just as long as I'm sensible. Um, so yeah, that's my, I guess that's my brain. But like statistically men avoid the, the physical health, mental health, like all of those things. And we mm -hmm. know from a mental health perspective, this isn't about you, but like the, the suicide rates are higher or men not talking or seeking help is, is yeah. actually a big yeah. risk factor when it comes to both physical and mental health. And, and that's been a big thing for me as well, actually trying to, um, connect with people um, on a personal level um, and and introducing things in, in the workplace to try to help. So I um, I trialed before uh, before the pandemic, we used to do walking meetings. So one to ones were walking meetings. So we'd go out of the office, we'd walk around the block um, and it was just you took away all of the, the constraints of the office environment and that worked really well. Introduced some um, mindfulness sessions at, at first thing in the morning once a week just as for people to come along and just share and and so many of those things were were really um there were little changes that were made little changes but they made quite a big difference um and, and yeah and that there's, there's probably a few things to to think about there absolutely it's this it's the tiniest things that make the difference and that's i think the landing message for people is like What's one small thing you can do today to invest in yourself? Mm -hmm. That might be going to bed earlier. That might be what, taking a walk around the block. That might be um, asking your, your, your manager or saying, hey, let's have a walk and talk meeting on our headphones, even though it's cold outside, but let's get mm -hmm. away from our screens. It's like disrupting some of the habits that we're forming in this new world of work that people are you know, evolving into, but nobody really knows, like everybody's experiencing it differently. Um, Kate, you talked about being a parent and that there's great flexibility, but there's, trust me, I've got two of them at home. There's challenges as well. I had to have a talk 
the other day with my teenagers. And I, my son turned 19 yesterday and my daughter's 16. And I went, I don't think anybody realizes that I'm the CEO of a company in this house. I said, I think everybody thinks that I'm a housewife because I'm home. And so it's like, hey, can we have dinner? Like, I need a snack, like all this sort of stuff. And I'm like, if I was like going into an office, I'd be dressed at seven. You wouldn't see me until eight in the evening or something like that. And I, and I was like, we need some boundaries in this household. And we had to really have that conversation, right? Because it had been slipping. But it's like, isn't it? You're like, great, there's flexibility and all these things. But there is this trade-off and these other pressures that people aren't necessarily talking about. Mm -hmm. Kate, yeah. what's it like for you as a working parent? No, exactly that. And actually, um, you know, I've, I've just fortunately got a fantastic boss who allowed me to sort of change my working hours because I was finding I was rolling out of this room stepping into the hall straight right. away Kitchen. where's my where's my food i'm hungry and it, it alarms me that that that's still going on at 19 and 16 i thought i hope that would drop off soon but okay good, good to know. <laughs> um yeah so that boundary and actually I, I need to finish earlier so that i can go for a walk or so that i can just sit before we then launch into the okay who's going to training tonight <laughs> what food are they going to eat you yeah. know because it is, it's just a, a blur from one one sort of role that you have in life to another. Um, and you are a different person, I think, at work sometimes to how you are, with, you know, with your children. So actually just sort of being able to rest and recover and just go, okay, I'm into my next part of my day now is quite important. And I have different goals with my children as well than I have in work. So sometimes it's important before I sort of launch into my evening to to just remind myself of, what that is otherwise I, I can be you know take my work person by which point I'm quite tired <laughs> take my work person to my parenting and that's not what I want for my children either so yeah I, it's I love not commuting absolutely love that um and love the fact that I can be at work at nine o'clock at my desk and have done some stuff beforehand but yeah those boundaries are very blurred and that's very tricky and I think that's that's one of my biggest struggles I think I love you. You talked about some of the skills there, which are creating buffers between home and work, even if, you know, and I love the coachy question, who do I want to be today? And so that could be like at work, who do, I, who do I want to be as a parent, as a boss, whatever it might be. And just that one conscious thought can enable me to show up in a slightly different way. Yeah, yeah. I'm, I'm conscious, um, conscious there's so much more we can talk about here. And I was thinking about personal things. So working, working from home, um, is is very different from working in the office and i've only only just realized the importance of actually having proper breaks i've been doing this for nearly three years and it's only just i think it was the the blood pressure thing that just sort of mm. hang on a minute when i have oh, a break I, I shouldn't just go and get a cup of tea and then come straight back to the screen and carry on that's not a break is it that's not healthy okay any any last thoughts from um from you kate and, and petra kate would you like to, any last comments no, there's loads to think about in there. I'm quite excited though. And I loved, I'm sort of thinking about step into your power, reflect and then let go. Cause that's one of the things that I, you know, particularly about those boundaries between mum and um, work. Um, so reflect and then let go and then step into your power. Um, I'm absolutely having to think about that later on today. So then yeah, I love it. Um, there's so much around parenting that also relates to management and leadership around having a coaching style, but also being open and vulnerable, even with our kids about like, hey, I'm figuring these boundaries things out. You know, that was the conversation I had was like, we need to learn together what this next stage of healthy boundaries looks like, obviously age appropriate, but it, it um, relates to our relationships as well. And like, being open about um, boundaries are all good, but if we don't tell anyone about them, they usually fall flat, right? We need to tell people in our households, in our teams, in our you know friendships that this is what we're doing so that we can create, again, that positive accountability. But um, one of my, my final messages just that's um, in my book that's coming out next year is around group think and learning to think for ourselves, even in the well-being and mental health space. And so, so many people are influenced by, I should do this, 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 and this before 5 a.m. And then they're stressed out and anxious. And you're like, oh, what's the one thing that you want to do that is going to be good for your body and your mind that can then stack forwards? So just kind of challenging people to think for themselves.
Does, uh, do you have a title for your book yet, Petra? Can you? Can yeah, you share? so it's, it's it's available for pre-order, which is very exciting, but kind of fake because it's not really out until next year in May. Uh, but it's to, it's called Begin with You. If you if you look at um, Amazon, just Google my name. It's my first book, so you'll see it pop up. Right. I look forward to reading it, Petra. Well, thank you, Petra. Thank you, Kate, for for a, a great BA Brew today, uh, and thank you to to all of you for joining us on uh, BA Brew. If you do have any questions or, or ideas for future episodes, then please email us at babrew at assistkd.com.